Okay. Are we good, Maria? Okay. It is, it is my pleasure and a great honor to introduce Maria Luisa Parra Velasco, a senior preceptor and language program director of Spanish in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures at Harvard University. Uh, Maria Luisa Parra earned, Velasco earned her bachelor's in psychology from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México and completed her master's and doctorate in Hispanic linguistics at the Centro de Estudios Lingüísticos y Literarios of the Colegio de México. Dr. Parra Velasco, and you don't know how difficult it is to, for me to say Dr. Parra Velasco when I want to say Maria Luisa, teaches both foreign language and heritage language classes. In her teaching, she combines knowledge from her studies in psychology and Hispanic linguistics and personal experiences with multilingualism in order to create an environment that invites students to develop a better understanding of the creative potential of language through reflection, questioning, and discovery. Barra Velasco's research explores theoretical and pedagogical approaches with the aim of developing a methodology for teaching Spanish to Latinx students. A particular interest is, her, is heritage language maintenance and identity. And Maria Luisa, you can correct me on everything. Maria Luisa has numerous publications, journal articles, book chapters, and among the more recent is uh, a book, Enseñanza del Español y Juventud Latina, published in 2021. In addition to her teaching and research, uh, Dr. Parra Velasco is the coordinator of the Romance uh, Language and Literatures Initiative on Teaching Spanish as a Heritage Language and is the founder and director of the Multilingual Family Resource Center. She also serves on the Immigration Initiative at Harvard and is actively involved in the Observatorio Cervantes de la Lengua Española at Harvard. As you may have gathered, her energy and dedication know no bounds. She is currently organizing the 10th National Symposium on Spanish as a Heritage Language, Las Semillas Que Plantamos, Past, Present, and Future in Spanish Heritage Language Education and Research in honor of Guadalupe Valdez, which will be held in April of 2023. I'm not alone in admiring Maria Luisa. In 2019, she was recognized by Babson University as one of the six most innovative professors of that year. And in 2022, she was voted as one of the favorite professors of the class of 2022 at Harvard and is currently featured in the Harvard College Faculty Spotlight Project. A devoted mother, inspiring educator, generous colleague, and profoundly kind individual, please join me in welcoming Maria Luisa Parra Velasco, who will speak on critical culture and language awareness through the arts. Wow, Sibyl, I, muchísimas gracias por esta, por esta um, presentación tan generosa. Thank you so much for this very generous introduction. I'm very happy to be here with, um, you know, invited by three of my favorite people, Maria Carrera, that is also uh, a model and inspiration to all of us and, and to me, Sibyl uh, and Alejandro, close friends and colleagues. Uh, and now that they have put together this amazing initiative, Heritage Language Exchange, that I think that everybody's learning from. And I'm so honored and happy to participate in um, with you this evening. So I'm going to start sharing my presentation. And <clears throat> the, the title of the presentation is Critical Cultural and Language Awareness Through the Arts. And um, again, I want to thank Maria Carrera, Sibyl, um, Alejandro Lee, and of course, all of you audience for being here with, with us tonight. Um, and the goal of the presentation is to discuss how the arts in heritage language education can raise critical cultural and language awareness and champion the, the diverse ethnolinguistic identities of Latinx students. Um, now the question is why creativity, right? Because we hear that, you know, creativity, the arts from very young ages, it's important, but the UNESCO um, in 1998 took creativity and critical thinking as, you know, they wanted to foreground it as models for knowledge and experimentation that were not yet fully explored in higher education. Um, so what I'm going to be presenting um, throughout this time are examples of the ways I have included creativity and the arts in my heritage language courses for Latino students um, at Harvard. Um, now, one of um, 
to, to give you some framework about uh, the work I do and how I conceive the arts and creativity. One question that you know, comes to mind very often is if creativity is an individual skill, you know, creative individuals, or does it have anything to do with social environment, right? And um, some of the main um, theories that have worked with creativity, they have proposed that creativity actually, of course, we have creative individuals, but it emerges within social, innovative, and collaborative context. If we have that context, then individuals, uh, even when they're already creative or not, they can, they can um, have more resources to engage in creative um, activities. So for these theorists, um, creativity, art making, it's a multidimensional uh, making process. Now, when we think about Spain, the Spanish speaking world, Latin America, I mean, there's nothing more than arts and creativity that, you know, is part of our daily lives everywhere where we look in every single corner of Latin America and Spain and well, the, the world, but I'm gonna be focusing on Spanish speaking world is creativity. Uh, and the creativity is intimately related to the history of that place. So Sibyl um, mentioned in her introduction that, you know, I have a background in developmental psychology and Hispanic linguistics, but throughout my work with Latino students, I have become a big advocate for including history and history of the language particularly and the arts as a way to learn about the history of our countries and cultures, uh, mainly about colonization, struggle for freedom and search for identity. And I'm gonna give you some examples about this and why I think it's so important. And the arts are the window to get into these um, new understandings, right? So something that we don't do very often in our classes is to talk about the history of the language and a specific period that is called El Barroco. Maybe in literature we do. Uh, but El Barroco, for example, it's I have found that mm, it's a very important period in our history. And I want you to remember this um, slide because we're going to go back to it at the end of the presentation. But in this video, when we're talking about um, this period of you know colonial uh, Mexico, I show students, I ask them to watch this video um, about the Arte Novo Hispano. And you see here Carlos Fuentes, a Mexican writer, is in the middle of the Mexican cathedral. That is a magnificent example of Baroque art. And he's explaining that the Baroque in Europe was a response to those sensorial voids created by long, history, uh, long wars of religion or religious wars. And in Europe, this during this period, the Baroque served to fill out those empty uh, spaces and um, struggles about the from the war uh, with music and with poetry, right? But in the Americas, when that kind of um, art came to the to the Americas, particularly in Mexico, he's talking about Mexico, the possibility of um, you know, Mexicans and indigenous communities engaging with this new form of art became a way to fulfill also those voids of identity that were in Mexico as a result of the colonial times. And they were trying to feel, um, to try to put together a utopia of new, um, with of a new identity, the new Mexican identity with the colonial reality, right? So that's what Carlos Fuentes is explaining about the Baroque. So the creative arts in the Spanish speaking world, uh, meaning poetry, visual arts, music, popular culture is vast, it's uh, diverse. And in my classes, it has become an 
innovative pedagogical way to engage students and not only to talk about you know descriptions and maybe a historical period but also to give them and to talk about cultural and symbolic affordances for mini making that they can then further apply and repurpose in creative assignments but that serve to a critical reflection about themselves, their, their identity, and the Spanish language. Um, so the examples that I'm going to show you are part of my class, Languaging and Latinx Identities. It's a uh, form with mm, five modules. I start with um, learning about the um, different dimensions of the Spanish language, the historical dimension, the, the um, geographical dimension, and the social dimension. Then we go to Latin America and learn about some traditions and arts in Latin America. Then we come and talk about the traditions that our families have brought to the US and how they have been transformed. We talk about the borderlands, of course, and what kind of innovations are Latino youth um, and cultures um, doing in the US as a result of all this complex process of immigration, transculturation. So during the every single one of these modules, um, there's some tension, not tension, but I mean, some forces that move us from tradition to innovation. Um, and we revisit constantly the history behind certain cultural products, practices, and traditions. Um, so the curriculum is informed by history, um, the arts, of course, cultural studies, the border and critical pedagogy, critical sociolinguistics and literature and poetry. And this is, I'm drawing also for, from the multiliteracies framework, because what I like about that framework, framework is that we, it moves us away from language. Language is one mode of meaning, but then if we bring up different kinds of text and we broader our definition of text, that becomes much um, dynamic, more productive, and students can engage with other representational resources to work um, through their understandings of language and culture. Um, so I'm not going to pretend to pronounce the last name of this author because I, I just can't, but you can read it. But he has underlined the beneficial role of working at a place and time in which other individuals are engaged in related creative activities. So the goal of the class is to um, create this environment where the arts are constantly being part of our class discussions to discuss not only the, the work of art, but also what is the narrative that is presenting about and from Latinx communities, what uh, Juan Flores calls the Latino imaginary. And also the goal is to provide students models to imitate, not necessarily to copy, but to imitate in further creative assignments. Um, as some of you know, I also, take my students to the museums and work with specific uh, pieces of art. And I have found that that movement from the classroom to the museums really um, is productive. Students engage with themselves as a group in a very different way and also with the arts. Um, and um, at Harvard, we have a, you know important collection of Latin American art uh, that you know, works very well with the course. Now, part of what the multiliteracy framework proposes, and I have, um, you know, I work with this model as well, and has been very productive, is to think about what, what do students do to know and to engage with a specific piece of text, visual or literary um, or auditory, right? So something that is very important is to provide students with opportunities to reflect at different levels um, about a specific text. So for example, if I present a work of art, I start always asking by, you know, what do you see there that is known? 
let's describe it. Um, and then I can provide new information about maybe the author or some detail that is going to turn that interpretation maybe differently or is going to give students a different perspectives. Then we're going to try to conceptualize new information and then we're going to analyze it critically. What does this piece, this text, this art is telling us in terms of you know, power relations, colonialism, racism, or discrimination in the Americas and in the US. And once we have that understanding, I provide students with opportunities to apply that knowledge into a creative assignment. So what I wanna do now is to give you some examples of uh, some of the work that we do in that regard. Um, I wrote here group project, but it's, it's one type of group project, but I have found Google slideshows incredibly helpful um, to work with art. Because for example, um, there's a class on um, Cortés and La Malinche, right? The, 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 this ideology of mestizaje, that we have to talk about it and we problematize it a little bit. So in the classroom, I work with um, the painting by Jose Clemente Orozco, the Mexican muralist that is very well known by this specific representation of Cortés and La Malinche. We talk about it, um, we learn about both, we learn about Orozco, but then the work is to look at the internet, each student, a, a new representation of La Malinche. Is it always represented the same way? and what the different representations means to understand this female figure and um, how to work with it. So each student has to work with one slide. I create the link, I send it, and everybody contributes to one slide and one description. And I use these also to practice comparisons. I give them the structures and they compare their own uh, image with the original of Orozco. So they work on, you know, es semejante a, es diferente porque, de la misma manera. So we practice specific structures to compare um, both images. And then in the classroom, we work with all of the representations and we find very interesting things. I do the same thing with the Baroque, where every student has to go and do research about a expression of Baroque in their country of origin. And we put together again, the Google slideshow, and this time they have to write a paragraph about that specific place. So, oops, just to give you an example, this student wrote this paragraph about this basilica in Peru. But what is interesting is that at the end, he says, one day I want to explore this place. And I think that that's, you know, very telling that how this kind of very simple assignments can trigger in students some curiosity uh, about their country of origin through, you know, a research on the Baroque. Um, so I thought that this slide could be, you know, informative about how students get interested in, in their own countries. We do the same thing about Latin American artists, women. Um, I teach, of course, a class on Frida Kahlo. You know that I'm a fan of Frida Kahlo, but I go beyond that. So for this assignment, students have to look for others, other artists that are not Frida in their own countries, female artists and how they have contributed to the, their culture. So they do the same assignment and then they describe, they do research, they learn about female artists in their own countries and everybody learns from everybody. Now, other way that I engage students um, with the arts is through poetry. I'm just going to present you one example here again from the Baroque um, because it's not something that we do very often, but we, I present very short examples of poetry and we start reading it, just reading it. And then let's, let's see what you understand. How do we feel? 
how what images emerges from these poems and students start noticing you know contrasts opposites metaphors uh, details something that can be very exaggerated um, so after we notice the syntax that can be reversed and what is the effect that it has on the poem and then I use um, Jamboard also in Google um, and we I put a paste for example one example like this poem by Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz that is playing with opposites um, and she's struggling, right? If someone loves me, I say no. If I, someone comes to me or rejects me, I say yes. So it's a back and forward, it's conflict, right? It, there's love and adoration and mistreatment. So, so we work with all these uh, characteristics of the Baroque and then they have to do their own Baroque poem. And this student didn't do anything particular about identity, but did something very creative with ice cream, right? And she's talking about how, you know, the more um, sick she gets with ice cream, the more she wants to eat. And well, she, she's playing with that. But the important thing is that she got it. She got the dynamics of the language of the poetry, um, of how the, the syntax can be reversed and the opposites. And it's, you know, a fun way to help them realize that they can not only read poetry, they can also write poetry. And that gives them, you know, more flexibility for further um, readings that we're going to do later in the semester. Now, I'm also a big fan of music. Um, and music is also an important part of my curriculum. But this song in particular is important and it's called, well, you have the, the title Latin America by the group Calle 13. And um, if you are a Spanish speaker, you probably know that it's a long song and the, it's a Puerto Rican group. And in the song, they talk about main, um, well, topics of identity. The song starts with soy. Uh, I am with they left behind. Um, the waste of what they stole. I'm um, you know, uh, people hidden in the mountains. So they right away strike with a theme of identity. And it's an identity that it's complex because it's what they left out and they was... Um, a leftover from something that was stolen. So it's a perfect beginning to um, start reflecting on the history of Latin America. And then the authors go and talk about some historical events, uh, literature, nature, religion, soccer. So the whole history of Latin America is compacted in this song. But the video is also amazing, right? Because it presents a collage of the diversity of Latin America, people, ages, context, uh, countries, uh, races. So we work both, analyze the words, the lyrics, and the video. And the group project is to remake the song. So I form teams where each team has to write a paragraph or of a verse of the song they have to send it to me and then I put together a new song of Latin America. So let me show you, um, okay, and this is the chorus, the chorus that says, you cannot buy the wind, the rain, the warmth, the clouds, the colors, the happiness, my pains, you cannot buy them. And we talk about who is that too? Was that you that cannot buy, right? So we talk about colonialism. And um, this is a version that a specific team did and they call themselves Calle 49 because it's the number of the course. And I'm just going to show you briefly um, some of the verses that they did. But for example, they start, I am, I am what they um, planted. I am all the flowers that my ancestors created. Um, 
people recreating life. My land are far, but I'm not hurt. If you read it in Spanish, it rhymes, right? Um, so, so, bueno, you can read it. Lo que sembraron, mis ancestros crearon, vida, herida. So we work with rhyme. This other student said, la gringa del norte, dice la gente, pero like, tengo el nopal bien puesto en la frente. Soy chingona con dos mundos entre mí, poniéndome las pilas para mi pueblo y el American dream. So they are rhyming, but they are taking that lyrics from Latin America and make it, you know, they kind of give new meaning through their own experiences. And then at the end, um, they bring themes of race, for example, black eyes, um, skin, olive skin, dark hair, uh, mixed blood, my roots are Latin X. Um, and then um, here, this student is kind of denouncing the, you know, United Fruit in Chiquita, Monsanto, La Migra. And their, the chorus is you cannot deport. Instead of you cannot buy, is you cannot deport. My spirit, my color, my history, our sweat, our pride, our song, our dream, our revolution. So this is a, another way in which students, you know, reflect on their history. They enjoy the music, we work with the video, and they repurpose all these resources to create their own meanings. Um, now, I want to show you now some examples about critical language awareness, right? And I'm going to show you three examples of artwork where students work three themes. One is the harmony of the Spanish language between a structure that is there, right, in this idea of the Spanish language, but also the change, because we talk about change in the class, right? Uh, change from, you know, migration through contact, etc. The second example is going to be about different variants and then transgenerational change. So this student wrote a poem, and this is why I show you, and I have mentioned poetry, because we work with poetry, and then as part of their final um, <clears throat> projects, some, some students choose to write poetry, not because it's the easiest, but because it's the hardest, and they want to engage in that, in that challenge, right? So this student wrote, a poem called El Arbol, the tree. If you look at that page, you can see that the poem is written as a tree, right? It has some kind of a tree form. And what is fascinating is that you can read it from top down and down, down up, the bottom up, and you can read it both ways. It's, it's really an amazing poem, right? And he is saying that for him, the Spanish language is like a tree. And what he's trying to represent in his poem is this harmony between the statics and the dynamism of the Spanish language. And he talks about how the, the trunk is some kind of basic structure of the language. And then we have the branches, maybe virants, and the leaves are the speakers, right? And it, for him, is this simultaneity of opposed um, forces that brings beauty to the Spanish language. So it's a very poetic um, reflection. Now, this other student wrote this, um, oh, painted um, this tower and his art is called Las Torres Castellanas de Babel. So we see here different towers and the tower in the center has three levels. This is a bronze, the silver, and the golden. And he's saying that the speakers can go from one to the other um, metal or, or stage, right? According to the resources they have. So each tower, because we have a big one here at the center and the little ones, each tower represent a variety of Spanish, Mexico, Colombian, from Spain. But within each variety, he's marking um, the different registers. 
Um, and he's saying that speakers can move up and forward depending on different things, but that brings a lot of dynamism also and nuances to the Spanish language and the speakers as well, resources for the speakers. Now, this is a project that did a student last semester and it's an audio collage. I have never heard anything like this, but what she's trying to do, and I'm gonna play you a little clip of it. What she's saying is that mm, for her, because we're talking about language and we hear it, um, she wanted to bring into her project different phrases, songs, words that have influenced her life. And that she's interested in the audio collage because in the first weeks of class, we learn about the influence of other e um, languages in the Spanish through a module of the history of the Spanish language. And then she says, the Spanish is an audio collage of vulgar Latin, Arabic, indigenous languages, and English. So I've never thought about that uh, idea of Spanish, but I thought it was beautiful. So um, I'm gonna play a little bit of the clip so you can hear it. You're gonna hear her, um, there's a song, she's saying, se abre el telón, and then she's talking to her mother, okay? Hello? Can you hear it? <laughs> Sube el telón, porque dicen quién llama. Bueno, la palabra llama es un sustituto para la palabra llama. Pero en Puerto Rico el campesino se caracterizaba por tener una manera diferente de decir las cosas. Yo no soy de la isla. ¿Y ustedes de dónde son? ¿Acaso de otra galaxia? ¿De la China o de la Japón? Okay, I'm going to leave it here. It's, it's a long clip. But at the end, what she's saying is that it's because of these songs that she was able in, in her awareness of this difference of nyama y llama in the conversations in the class about different virants and registers of the Spanish language that she was curious and she wanted to talk to her mother about it. And it was through these songs that the, that conversation, you know, allowed the student to hear from her mother new anecdotes anecdotes from mother's life that she had never heard before. So I also thought that it would be interesting for, for us in this presentation to realize that whatever we do in the classroom also can connect students with their own parents or grandparents. And I know that here, um, Maria Carrera and, and Sibyl and Alejandro have done some work to engage with families as well, but through the arts, I have found it, find it very productive. Now, this is another example of um, creativity that I have never thought about, but I thought it was really interesting. And this student was, um, wanted to represent transgenerational change in Spanish, because we talk about change all the time and how the Spanish language is not a static. So what she did was to have three um, pieces of cardboard here for, is the first one. And in this one, we see pictures of her grandparents and the word Espanol written with Play-Doh, okay? And they, the, their grandparents are in their country of origin and in at their community. And then she represented her parents now in the US, right, with different pictures. And you can notice that the word Espanol is also in play though, but it's a little bit thinner, right? So she's representing change through the thickness of the word Espanol. And she's given the context with the pictures of grandparents and parents. And then the third, is um, her own self in the US with peers 
and you can see a Spanish there, but it's a little bit more, um, it has a different shape. And she's talking about how her Spanish, it's, you know, changing shapes as it becomes in contact with English, or it has been also in contact with English through her um, life. So I thought that I like this because it's the same material. She shapes it differently to give an understanding of linguistic transgenerational change. So I found it pretty creative. Now, um, and this is the last part of, of the presentation about language and creativity. So, as I said, we work with Latin America artists, women, and one of the assignments in my class is a self-portrait. And what this student do was to um, research about uh, Mexican artists, and she found this artist here. Her name, her ori original name was Carmen Mondragón, but her nickname was Nahui Olin. And she had amazing green eyes, really, not that big, but very, very green. But when she did her own, um, I mean, her self-portrait, she always represented herself with these huge eyes. So the student loved that. And she said that, you know, I like, I chose her because of her big eyes, because eyes are the first thing people see. And they're also the windows to our soul. Um, so she's representing herself here. And then she also took inspiration of Frida Kahlo, this famous painting that she, Frida did at Detroit, in Detroit, and it's called At the Border. And you, know, you can see Frida uh, on top of a pedestal here, but it's at the border, it's divided the painting between Detroit and Mexico. And she has different symbolic elements for both countries. And that's the same thing that the student is doing. She has the wall here, the flags, uh, pyramids, music, church, and then um, other elements here from the American culture. So again, the research, the, the work we did in class provided them with symbolic affordances for her to be able to create and reflect on her own identity at the borders. Now, these other two examples are also very interesting, and they are talking about roots to the indigenous heritage, in particular, this student, uh, because you can see her hair is almost like part of the, you know, um, surcos aquí, del, para cultivar, and the tree. So she's almost part of the um, paisaje, no? the landscape. And the same with this other student, she's merging with all the flowers, but at the same time, a very um, modern contemporary element that is the phone, the selfie, um, because we talk about the difference between self-portrait and selfie. Now, this student uh, wrote a poem, it's much large and uh, more complex, but the title is puzzle, a puzzle, un rompecabezas. And the interesting thing about this student is that the whole poem is in, she uses English and Spanish back and forward, back and forward. And what she's saying is that she, she doesn't want to say that she's in a liminal space. She wants to claim her own identity as a Mexican American and decide who she is, even when is a puzzle, right? And her artwork it's a collage of pictures, Mexican and American flag. She's at the center, a picture from her country of origin and at the US, aquí está Din Kurana from Harvard. <laughs> but what I loved it is that she did this, it's not just the collage, it's a puzzle. The collage is a puzzle and the poems and title is puzzle. So I thought that that merging also between a title of the poem a poem written in English and Spanish. And then this um, visual representation was very powerful also and creative. Now I have also had this, um, I had one student that decided to do a video and performance. 
And you can see here the same student doing four different, well, five, but you know, there she is the same, but in three different identities, right? And guess who is this uh, person here? That's me. And when you watch the video, yeah, yeah. she's she's so good at imitating me, you know, because I'm saying we're going to talk about Spanglish. And I'm calling out uh, this version of her in gray. So she's like, who, me? And then she can't answer the question, but then she moves to dance, uh, is this yellow bubble here. And she's singing. She used a song by the Backstreet Boys. Um, and then she put the lyrics in Spanish. And she's saying that, you know, when Latinas look at me, I know what they see. Uh, a blonde uh, girl that cannot speak her language with any fluidez, with any flu um, fluency. They call me pocha and lame, but it's my culture. Um, and I always have to defend them, defend it. I'm not lying when I say that I'm Chicana through and through, but the nuances of race, culture, and language are complicated and they don't depend on you. So this was also very creative, okay. And this is the last example that I wanna show you. And you can see here um, the profile of the student. And then they have these roses coming out or flowers coming out of her mouth, but the flowers are um, multicolor. In some places, maybe here, you can see there's golden. And this golden is filling out spaces. So at the beginning of the presentation, we saw something about gold to fill out voice and voids and spaces. And this is what she wrote. The painting I have created is inspired in the Baroque. The Baroque, it's a form of art that exegeres uh, with a variety of techniques and materials to avoid the empty uh, spaces, right? The use of shiny or gold in my art, it's a response to that emptiness, to the emptiness that I feel within me because of the wars of identity that I face every day. I'm African, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Latina, and American. The different colors means that I am bilingual. The flowers are emblematic of the Hispanic culture, but also about my own growth and evolution. Um, from my point of view, to find out who you are, it's a journey. Um, not It's disorganized, but it's precious at the same time. And um, in this class has helped me to break my um, cascara, help me here. Um, it's, it's not mask, it's like the, um, a shell. And now I can speak Spanish with my relatives, even when they make fun of me. The battle to find who you are never stops. And I think it's important to have a way to express um, these struggles like this project was for me. So this is talking to me directly about how important or how meaningful creative um, assignments can be for students to work out through their own thinking and reflections about their identity. But I wanted to end the examples of the presentation with this example of the Baroque because it was the first thing that we saw in class. I never thought anybody would use any uh, reference to the Baroque, but uh, there you go, um, one student did. So just to, to wrap up the presentation, I want to show you some uh, reflections from students um, for the course evaluations. They really like working with different materials um, because they allow them to explore more fully their Latinx identity. Um, they get a solid understanding that their Spanish language is diverse. They can use that knowledge to reflect um, on their own standing and unique experiences. Um, they are challenged by learning some facts of the history of the Spanish language, and they can also have connections with their parents or grandparents 
and strengthen that um, connection. And about creativity, they definitely liked it. Um, it helped them to better process the topics um, and to fully understand them. Um, they build up their Spanish practice in a different way. And what is interesting is the last comment that says, I found that writing poems in Spanish helped me write essays better in other classes. So I thought that that was a, this is a nice line of research for future research to see how much that work in the Spanish language class also informs writing practices in English, right? And with this, I do want to thank you in the presentation. Thank you very much, Maria. That was really a wonderful presentation. And it, it's, I can't think of a better way for us to close the cycle of the Hispanic Heritage Month. It was inspiring. I think your students are extraordinarily fortunate that uh, you provide these very powerful and empowering uh, activities for them. Um, and you inspire, I think, all of us to to be creative and to try different uh, ways of connecting with our students and helping them connect to their, their roots, to their identity. Um, are there any questions or comments? Maria. First of all, muchísimas gracias, María Elisa, por esa bellísima presentación. Sentí que tenía ganas de, de, de estar en tu curso. Me hubiera encantado <laughs> poder crear de esa manera. Um, the question I have for you, though, is in a language department, don't you encounter a lot of resistance uh, with moving away from language and, and, and putting the focus on art? I love it, but aren't the more traditional colleagues likely to fight you on that? And how do you deal with that? Well, I no, no, no colleagues fight <laughs> with me. Uh, but what is interesting and important about your question, Maria, is that I work language all the time. So I take art as a pretext to work with language. We need content that we know, right? Without content, we can't teach language. So for example, um, if I work with a specific painting, we start working with what do you see? What's there? Let's describe description, adjectives, vocabulary. And then we work on, you know, we can work on prepositions. Um, as I said, comparison, um, giving opinions, let's debate. So language is always part of any kind of work I do with creativity. And when I give them the assignment to look um, and build the Google slide show, they have to write the paragraph. I review that paragraph and I work with that. So it's not, um, it doesn't exclude each other, the art with the- No, no, it, it's very language. obvious that you really develop the language uh, with this approach, but it's sometimes in traditional departments, if you're not teaching a traditional grammar-based course that's, a, that's curricularized um, yeah. and sequential, uh, you're going to encounter resistance from colleagues. Uh, that, that hasn't been the case for you. Well, um, this is important. This is a course for Latino students, and I'm the only one that teaches that class, okay? But in our regular language program, L2 program, we do have specific classes called Minutos de Arte. So after reviewing, let's say, descriptions or present verbs or present continuous, we do work with one piece of art where students need to use that structure to describe the person, like what's happening, uh, make hypotheses, whatever. So we do um, include art as part of the regular curriculum as well, but it's one of the many activities, but we use them for students to integrate what they have learned before. 
I have a question, Maria. We have a very rigorous placement program and students have to place in a particular level. Are these, um, you said you, this is a course for Latinx students. Is there a placement or is it just they're Latinx, they're in the class? So because this is just one class of 15 students, um, it's growing. By now I could have two sections a semester, but I don't have the instructors. Uh, but um, if there's an application form, they have to fill out in Spanish. But I have received students that, I mean, this is kind of an intermediate, pretty advanced class, but I have received students that come to me and say, I'm not very fluent, but I do want to be in your class. And I, you know, accept them and I have to work a little bit extra with them in office hours. Um, I change a little bit the assignments, but I, I have the freedom to accept whoever wants to be in the class as long as, you know, it's not a 20 student class. Um, but the cap is 15. Sometimes I have 18. Um, so I, I work with them if they're comfortable, if they want the challenge, then they're more than welcome. Thank you. Liz, you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you so much, Maria. It was so great to hear you and um, feel inspired to teach native speakers. And while I don't have many native speakers at the school that I currently teach, we do have a very small uh, population and they're part of a club and whatnot. But my question has to do with the word um, Latinx. And there's been a lot of curiosity behind that. And so some of my students have been kind of pushing the term Latine. So I was just curious if you have, you know, given that you teach so many native speakers, if that's a push that you're also hearing on your end. Well, Liz, thank you for the question. I think that that's the question of the moment, right? And I think that nobody agrees on what to do and what to say. Um, I think that, well, the Pew Hispanic Research Center has done a survey where they um, noted that the Latinx, the word Latinx, is only used by 3% of the Latino community, mainly women, Nobody understands beyond that or besides that or outside that 3%, people don't really get it or understand it and they don't use it. Actually, I just read today an article about a push, you know, a pushback and saying, no, don't, don't, for vaya Latina, saying, I'm not using that. It comes from English, uh, it's not coming from the community, I'm not using it. In my context, but, you know, um, Harvard, academia, elite, is they use Latin X and Latine. Um, I think that this is a topic to, you know, it's a it's, um, debate that, you know, we all, we have questions. I just had a, made a presentation at Penn State about inclusive language and of course, Latinx and Latine, Latini, uh, it's, it's there. So I don't, I don't know. It's, I use sometimes Latinx and then Latino and then Latina. I kind of use uh, the the full range, but I think that it depends on the context you are, and not everybody uses Latinx. If I go to the community, I I try to hear what they're using, and then maybe I'll use that. But I don't take for granted that it is Latinx. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much. De nada. Uh, Jesús, you have a question? Sí, eh, muchas gracias, María. Felicitaciones. De verdad que se nota que tu trabajo está bastante trabajado y, y comprobado en la clase con distintas audiencias. Pero te quería preguntar a manera personal, ¿cómo haces para motivar a los estudiantes? Porque algunas veces el estudiante no, no muestra de interés, pues simplemente está allí por estar Entiendo que son estudiantes de lengua de herencia y claro, eso de alguna forma los hace más o menos medio nativos, pero ¿cómo tienes alguna, algo que podrías compartir para motivar al estudiante o algún dato, alguna cuestión? Me interesaría mucho escuchar. Sí, gracias Jesús. Bueno, cuando yo empecé 
eh, este curso lo, uh, lo empecé. Um, should I speak in English for the audience? María. Oh, ok, en español está bien. Ok, yo lo empecé con un grupo focal con estudiantes latinos. No había nada en Harvard y yo quería hacer un grupo, uh, una clase. Pero primero les pregunté a los estudiantes, si ustedes tuvieran una clase, ¿qué les gustaría? Nos fuimos a desayunar y me dieron ideas. Yo ya sabía como más o menos qué es lo que quería yo tener en el curso, pero ellos me dieron ideas. Pero también he ido cambiando el curso conforme lo he ido enseñando. Empecé con, una, con un currículum que estaba organizado alrededor de, de géneros textuales. Entonces armé todo alrededor de géneros textuales. Ahora me he movido más a temas, porque yo creo que a los estudiantes... Siempre se les motiva cuando uno da en el clavo del tema que les interesa. Entonces, ¿qué les interesa? Pues la identidad, quiénes son, qué es esto del Spanglish. Eh, y cuando he tenido la fortuna de que nunca he anunciado el curso, ellos se han ido pasando la voz de que tienen que, o sea, de que recomiendan el curso, ¿no? Entonces llegan a la clase, unos llegan como con mucho miedo, otros llegan listos para hablar. Y la primera pregunta es, ¿por qué están en la clase? A los latinos, ¿no? Entonces, no, porque no hablo bien, porque mi abuelita dice no sé qué, porque no le pongo el acento. Y a partir de eso, yo voy haciendo preguntas y voy haciendo comentarios que yo sé que ellos, con una perspectiva que yo sé que no es común que ellos escuchen. Y entonces abro un espacio donde ellos pueden empezar a compartir. Todo mundo se da cuenta que todo mundo tiene miedo, tiene dudas, se equivoca. Eh, y vamos, lo vamos yo nunca tomo una posición normativa. O sea, en enseño la norma, digamos, ¿no? Pero no digo, ay, oye, pues qué mal. Oigan, no, no vamos a hablar Spanglish. Oigan, está mal población, es pocho. De hecho... Yo les digo que palabras como población, mayoridad, minoridad, me es difícil, las famosas carpetas y todo esto, ¿no? Me es muy difícil decir que están mal porque las usan las comunidades. Que no esté generalizado es otra cosa, pero les digo, híjole, <ríe> mi mexicanísimo híjole, pues no está generalizado en todo el mundo hispanohablante, está mal. Entonces, todas esas, eh, es una nueva perspectiva sociolingüística que ellos, es nueva porque ellos no la han escuchado. Entonces, como que se quedan un poco picados y empiezan a bajar un poco la ansiedad. Y eh, al mismo tiempo, todas las semanas hay eh, tareas y lo que yo hago con las tareas como no sé qué vocabulario ya saben y cuál no, entonces hago como lineamientos para cada tarea que tiene un tema específico de reflexión. Tienen que buscar, por ejemplo, cinco palabras nuevas que yo no sé qué quieren decir. Entonces ellos tienen que buscarlas. Cinco conectores discursivos y tienen que cumplir con una serie de lineamientos, ¿no? aprenden muchísimo vocabulario, eh, constantemente trato de que compartan sus experiencias y aprenden muchísimo de los otros. Entonces, eh, los, los ganchos son perspectivas, algún comentario, bueno, primero mostrar un interés mío de por qué están en la clase. Y segundo, eh, no critico eh, presento una perspectiva sociolingüística, eh, doy sugerencias, si usas población, pues a lo mejor te entienden en Estados Unidos, pero no te van a entender en otro lado, cuestiono mucho las narrativas negativas, le juego al advocate's devil, ¿no? o devil's advocate, un poquito, y, y funciona muy bien. Eso para los latinos ha funcionado súper. Me, me gustaría 
primero agradecer por la presentación y segundo, eh, yo trabajo en una escuela en Cincinnati, Ohio y siempre mis estudiantes latinos han sido niños de padres eh, profesionales. Eh, gracias a Dios por los últimos cinco años, mi escuela ha estado tratando de extender esta invitación, porque es una escuela privada, a niños que no tienen las condiciones para pagar, los recursos para pagar para mi escuela. Entonces, al principio estuvieron aprendiendo alemán, francés, pero no español. El año pasado tuve por primera vez algunos estudiantes eh, descendientes de guatemaltecos y mexicanos. Y me sorprendió mucho que vinieron a la clase. Y una de las cosas que y hago yo es tengo este, clases de tutoría virtual con niños en Perú, en zonas como en los Andes, en zonas marginales. Entonces, cuando mis estudiantes ¿no? encuentran cosas en común, ¿no? no tener miedo de usar el idioma, nadie les va a criticar cómo lo están usando. Se sienten que están al mismo nivel que los otros muchachos que son hijos de padres profesionales, porque al final todos están haciendo lo mismo, que es ayudar a niños de tercer grado de primaria a aprender fracciones. ¿No? Entonces, yo estoy muy contenta por el progreso que estos muchachos están teniendo porque ya no tienen vergüenza de hablar el idioma. ¿No? Sus padres en muchas situaciones no tuvieron la capacidad de terminar sus estudios primarios o secundarios. ¿No? Pero yo trato de centralizar el esfuerzo que sus padres han puesto por traerlos aquí y por darles un futuro completamente diferente. Y que esos niños que ellos están dando tutoría no tienen la capacidad de estar en el sitio donde están ellos hoy. Y eso ha funcionado de una manera increíble porque ahora los chicos están queriendo tomar español, quieren estar parte de la clase de AP, ¿no? Y me da mucho gusto eh, que sientan respeto por, por el idioma, no tanto respeto, pero el valor del idioma, ¿no? Que todo lo que sus, han aprendido de sus padres, porque yo quiero que compartan las costumbres y todo esto, eh, enriquece a toda la clase. Entonces, desde ese punto de vista, me encanta su presentación porque usted habla mucho de la cultura. Yo pienso que es muy importante ahora más que nunca, porque hay tantos sentimientos negativos, ¿no? Eh, que estos niños se sientan en un sitio donde tienen la capacidad de expresar sus ideas y se sienten aceptados. Entonces, muchísimas gracias por su presentación. No, muchísimas gracias, Patricia. Sus comentarios son muy inspiradores también, ¿no? Y creo que eso, ese es la... La meta, alguna vez en algún panel me preguntaron que cuál era la meta de mis clases y para mí la meta va más allá de lo lingüístico y es justamente romper esa barrera afectiva, negativa, esa vergüenza y decir, y que los estudiantes terminen la clase motivados para seguir aprendiendo, porque nadie aprende todo en un semestre. Entonces, el chiste es que primero cobren esa, ese orgullo por la identidad y, y quieran seguir motivados. Me, me parece excelentísimo. Gracias. Bueno, pues María, María Luisa, queremos agradecerte todos de, de, de fondo de nuestro corazón por todo, todo lo que haces por la comunidad por tus estudiantes y por compartir todo con nosotros, porque realmente creo que todos hemos aprendido algo y nos has inspirado. Ahora, you set the bar a little high for us, <laughs> pero no importa, así nos esforzamos Mira un poco. quién habla, Civil, por favor. Bueno, no, bueno. bueno. <laughs> no, bueno. Um, en todo caso, ah, hay una última pregunta. de hay una última pregunta. Ok. Hello. ¿Me escuchan? Sí, 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 Evelyn. Disculpa, la, estoy estacionada tratando de, de ya terminar la clase con ustedes. Muchísimas gracias. Mira, tu clase ha sido muy enriquecedora. Eh, yo tengo un bachelor en artes y desde que llevo 17 años en los Estados Unidos enseñando español a todos los niveles, 
eh, por fin, después de 17 años, siento que, que estoy en el camino correcto. Lo que tú realmente has enseñado hoy es lo que he tratado de difundir en mi clase durante muchos, muchos años. Pero, en una comunidad en uh, South Carolina, que no tengo ningún alumno que es hispano, ni hay mucho contacto con la comunidad hispana. So, me ha tocado un poco duro por, por sensibilizar a los muchachos, a los estudiantes, y te enseño español, honores 1, 2, 3 y AP class. ¿Tú tendrás alguna recomendación? Porque, porque he tenido que trabajar un poquito más de lo, de lo usual este, para tener acceso, por ejemplo, a los artistas... Um, hispanos, eh, las retratistas, por ejemplo, que hiciste, los eh, lo, uh, self-portrait, algún tipo de, de recomendación, algún tipo de, um, de material que uno pueda accesar y, y enriquezca más la, las lecciones de la clase. Bueno, creo que depende de qué tema quieras trabajar. Eh, materiales debe de haber muchísimos, por ejemplo, yo buscaría en bibliotecas públicas o, bueno, en el, en el internet ahora encuentras muchas cosas, pero... Mm, pero no en tus lecciones, ¿Perdón? En tu lec eh, tus lecciones prácticamente, por ejemplo, los artistas que hiciste referencia, por ejemplo, en la música, en la pintura, ah. ese tipo de, de referencia, ¿hay, hay algún lugar... O, ¿O tú compartirías, compartirás un poco los nombres? Porque como estaba manejando, no pude anotar. Y, y sí, eh, bueno, eh, manejo, pero no. Y, ajá, esta es una pregunta muy buena. Porque yo no conocía muchas de, estas, de estos artistas. Yo los he venido a conocer acá. Y muchas veces es por los estudiantes. O mm. porque hablo con colegas y me entero que, ah, pues este cuento queda buenísimo, o sea, un cuento que leí hace 20 años cuando empecé a, a, a enseñar español acá, me acordé que, uy, este cuento quedaría fabuloso aquí, que hay entre ese yo ni idea, pero lo conocí por una amiga, o sea, estoy constantemente tratando de hablar, de aprender, de no, no, y estoy segura que hay muchísimas cosas que dejo fuera. Eh, entonces, eh, bueno, Gracias a mis estudiantes sé quién es Bad Bunny y lo, lo importante que es. Siempre les estoy diciendo, vamos a hacer el playlist para que yo me entere de quiénes son los últimos de la música, ¿no? Eh, muy en contacto con el Museo de Arte, eh, pero definitivamente hay que estar pues tratando de, de conectarse con lo que hay en la comunidad y con gente que sabe. Eso es muy importante. Alejandro. Hablar con gente que sabe. Perdón, Alejandro en el chat ha puesto unas cuantas sugerencias. Eh, María Luisa, ¿nos permitirías colgar tu presentación eh, de PowerPoint? Vamos a lo grabamos, por supuesto, y eso lo vamos a poner. Pero además de eso, poner la presentación y quizás crear un espacio donde vayamos poniendo, colocando todos estos recursos. Correcto. Ok, pues lo haremos. Excelente, excelente. A ti. Perdón por el perro, ¿eh? No. Bueno, se nos acaba el tiempo y... Ah, bueno. Oh. Si es rapidita la pregunta, sí. Sí, sí, bueno. Hola, María Luisa. Estupenda presentación, magnífica conexión con la, el barroco y el arte. Súper sí. creativo, me encanta. Mi obsesión del momento, el barroco. No, sí, estupendo. Una, un comentario que hiciste sobre uno de tus alumnos que dijo que es tu clase le sirvió para mejorar sus habilidades de escritura en otras clases. Y yo creo que eso es algo que las clases de, uh, para estudiantes de herencia Uh, son muy importantes y mucha gente no se detiene a ver eso, ¿no? Eso es un, un valor increíble para ellos en su educación. Así que muchas gracias por mencionarlo. Para mí es una lucha continua convencer a los administradores de, de mi universidad de que las clases de español para estudiantes de herencia son más que una clase de español, es ayudarles 
a, a desem, des, desenvolverse como personas, como individuos, y una vez que se sienten cómodos consigo, consigo mismos, eh, se les mejora la vida académicamente y profesionalmente, personalmente, etcétera, etcétera. Así que muchísimas gracias por tu labor, por todo lo que estás haciendo con esos chicos. Yo espero que cuando ellos salgan de ahí, no se olviden de los demás ¿no? que vienen detrás de ellos. Así que gracias. Kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Ok, bueno, pues entonces, María Luisa, otra vez, muchas gracias. Eh, seguro Pero gracias a ustedes y, y felicidades a, a María Carreira, Alejandro y Sibel por la iniciativa que está siendo súper productiva y, y un lugar muy importante para todos nosotros. Así que muchas gracias. Y muy gracias bien. a todos por estar no, en la presentación. Fue un placer. Y también quisiera anunciar que el 3 de noviembre tenemos eh, una... Un evento, a celebration of Teach uh, Portuguese Week, uh, y el título es Making Space for Plurality and Inclusion in the Portuguese Language Classroom. Es un evento que será un jueves, no un lunes, el 3 de noviembre a la una y media de la tarde en California, cuatro y media en la costa. Este, el anuncio estará y recibirán como 15 mil correos. <laughs> Eh, referentes a ello eh, y nada, esperamos verlos es un panel muy interesante también, María, ¿cuál es la fecha de Stephen Crash? Yes. Estás en el... 7 de noviembre no. Exacto Ok, entonces es otro evento eh, entonces ha sido un, un semestre unos meses muy llenos de eventos y gracias a ustedes por venir y por compartir sus ideas y y por su presencia e interés en, en el mundo de Heritage Language Learning. Y María. Para más información para estos dos eventos, vayan a hlexchange.com y se pueden ahí inscribir para los dos eventos o cualquiera de los dos eventos. María Luisa, ¿quieres a invitarlos a tu simposio rapidito? Sí, todos están invitados a... Warm Boston, <ríe> a la primavera. El eh, simposio va a ser en abril 13, 14 y 15. Eh, creo que Alejandro ha puesto ya la, el, el website, está ya el Code for Proposals Open, creo que se cierra a principios de noviembre. Se mandarán las eh, notificaciones, me parece que en diciembre o enero. <ríe> Así que... Eh, Vamos a honrar a Guadalupe Valdés, María Carrera va a ser Kino, esperemos contar con eh, Alejandro y Sibyl también en una sesión eh, de Excel Exchange, así que todos están invitados, invitadas, invitades. <música>